You're supposed to be conducting business until he comes back. Not your business. Kingdom business. That's why I told him to occupy until I come. This is so important for us to recognize and to discern that it is our job to do business. We're to transact heavenly business. What's heavenly business? Snatching people from the grips of hell. What's heavenly business? Recovering the sheep that are lost. Hi, and welcome to Stone Point Community Church, where your life is made better. Thank you for listening to our podcast, and thanks for supporting the ministry. If you enjoyed today's message, why don't you be a blessing and share it with a friend? We appreciate you and pray for God's very best in your life. If you would, let's turn to the book of Romans 13. We're going to go to verse 11 and put in the message Bible if you guys would back there. As we are uh, gearing up for this weekend, um, it's one of those things where I think it's, mind, it's important for us to be uh, mindful of the idea that what God is doing here in the earth. We were talking about visitations um, and understanding the purpose of the church, the purpose of having a shepherd. And I want to talk to you about being a visitation. Um, but make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day-to-day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off, oblivious to God. The night is about over, dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work he began when we first believed. We can't afford to waste a minute. Must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence, in sleeping around and dissipation in bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Get out of bed, get dressed. Don't loiter and linger, waiting until every last minute. Dress yourselves in Christ and be up and about. As he begins to give a discourse in regards to the seasons in which we are in, He's talking to believers about where we are today. In other words, he's talking about the work that God has begun, the purposes that God is affecting, and he's saying, don't be asleep. In other words, wake up and realize that if you are paying attention in any way, shape, or form, you have got to see where this world is going. You've got to be able to see that the, the uh, policies and the media and the culture, it's all, it's all uh, struggling with any sense of morality and any sense of composure. Um, it, it's, it's something that if you're paying attention, you can see it. And how many of you understand that The Bible says perilous times will come. So anybody that tells you that we don't have to go through these times and these seasons is not telling you the truth. Because these things are going to happen. But he he calls us the remedy to the world's problems. And a lot of times people sit around and they have conversations about, well, one day somebody should do something about this. Uh, you know, you watch TV, sipping your coffee and going, oh, oh my, one day somebody ought to do something. Well, today is someday, and you are that somebody. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. <clears throat> As the Apostle Paul warns us in the book of Romans, he says, don't become so consumed 
with your day-to-day -day life, with your responsibilities, with your job, with all the things that, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but I have no shortage of demand. I, I'm at the stage now where I'm making decisions not about uh, what I'm going to do, but what I'm not going to do. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? And <clears throat> I think that there's always things that need to get done. There's always a propensity to try to keep us busy. Uh, busy, I believe, as an acrostic, which is being under Satan's yoke. Uh, being so busy that you can't see the real important matters that are around you. So busy that you can't discern what's really happening in your world. And Satan loves nothing more than for you to be so busy that you appear to be asleep. Because this is the, the allegory he's making. This is the connection he's making. He's saying that as long as you stay in this slumber of busyness, he said, you'll never wake up and see what's really going on. You'll never be able to discern what's going on in this world and in this time and in this season. And so Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 in the King James, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Is it thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men? Ye are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on the candlestick it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your lights shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He calls you salt, and he calls you light. And if you have noticed, there has been a pushing away from the things of God. It's been a, a, a lifestyle of we can do what we want to do. If it seems right in the world, to my own eyes, then that's what we're going to do. It is a plethora of opinions and moral values and lifestyles. And all of that is based on a lack of salt. How many of you, like me, when you see certain things, it's just not palatable to you? Yes, you, you literally want to spit it out. Yes, well, that's why I said you're salt. It's your job to make it taste better. <laughs> it's your job to season it so that it tastes better. It becomes more palatable, not only to you, but unto God. And he said, what happens if the salt stops doing its job? What happens if it becomes uh, of no effect? He said the only thing it's good for is to be thrown under and be trodden underfoot. Now, to understand salt, salt was more valuable than gold in those times because salt was not easy to come by. And salt was the only method of preservation of food. In other words, you couldn't preserve, you know, there's no refrigerators. So you couldn't preserve food without having salt. And so salt had such a high value because of its ability to preserve, because of its ability to protect, because of its ability to flavor. And how many of you understand that's our job? Our job is to preserve, it is to protect, and it is to season this world. It's to make things more palatable. And as we begin to grow in our walk with God, it is more important that the world sees you as salt. See, salt kills germs. When germs come in contact with salt, that's why the old saying, to rub salt in a wound. It hurts. It stings. Why? Because salt is designed for that purpose. And if you live in a world where you love to people please, then you're going to struggle with being salt because you're afraid that people will be offended. But we can either put some salt in the wound 
and kill the bacteria. Or later on, we can just cut it all off. And I think that's where God is saying to you, you're the salt. Because there will come a time where God will cut it off. But the hope is that you understand your job here is to season this world with salt so it doesn't get cut off. Or at least let's say it this way, so that everybody in it don't get cut off. We're in an absolute race against time to build God's kingdom, to get people into the family, and to get them to grow with the things concerning him. And then he calls you light. He says, a light, you don't light a candle and then put it under a bushel. He said, there's no point in that. He said, the reason why I changed your life is so that people would see it. The reason why I stepped into your world and turned it upside down is so people would see it. He said, the reason why I got you delivered from the situations you were delivered from is so people could see it. He said, I didn't do that so you could hide it and keep it as your personal testimony. He said, I did that so that the world would know that if they did it for me, he'll do it for So then he says, everything that is in you as light, you should not be putting it under a bushel, but you should be setting it up on a candlestick so that the world would know and the world would see. Now, if I could be honest with you, a lot of Christians, the reason why they don't put themselves up on a candlestick to be seen is because a lot of stuff they do is in the dark. They're more comfortable in the dark. Their life has not been changed. And it should have been. Are you following me? It should be changed. You should be different. And instead of allowing people in the world to accentuate your difference and make you feel bad about being different, you ought to be celebrating the fact that I'm just not like you anymore. I'm just not the same person that I used to be anymore. That things are just different for me than it used to be. I used to be broke. I used to be busted. I used to be disgusted. I used to have attitude. I used to have problems. And now you don't understand. Everything is not perfect in my life. But God shows up for me every single time. And because I trust in him, I live a different life than you. And I assure you, if you follow him... He'll do exactly the same thing for you. Amen. See, <clears throat> the idea of light is we are simply what will be considered a luminary. It is a reflection of light. How many of you know the moon is not lit up? There's no light on the moon. When you see the moon lit up, it's a reflection of the sun. It's not that I am, I am ascribing to the idea or presenting or postulating the idea to you that you should be putting yourself on a pedestal. What I'm telling you is you should reflect the sun. Not S-U-N, but S-O-N. And when you reflect the sun, you become a luminary. You become a reflection of him. That's why the Bible says till we all come into the unity of faith that we are walking as we are like him. He is not here on this planet in bodily form. You are. He's the head. You're the body. And it is your job to reflect him into the world so that the world may see the light that shines in your life. Not because of you. Because your righteousness is filthy rags. But because of the God you serve and the things that he has done and your life are to be seen. Then he goes on to say in, uh, give me Philippians 2, 14. So today we're asking people how they give. Excuse me. Hi, do you give? I do. How do you give? Through my phone or through the envelopes. Is giving with envelopes easy? It is. You get the cash mula, you go put it in there, you lick the envelope, you be like, here you go. So easy, huh? Yeah, super easy. Do you guys give? Yes. How do you give? 10% of your money. You give online? Yes. Hey, I had a question. Yeah. Do you give? Yes, I do. Awesome. Is it very easy to give? It is very easy. Just, just give. You just gotta do it. You just gotta do it. Just do it. Hey, hey Austin, excuse me. Do you give? Uh, yeah. How do you give? I do it online almost exclusively now. Is it very easy to give online? It's real easy. How easy? What are the steps? I go to scc.church and I click the donate tab and I just fill in the info. Giving online is so easy. Excuse me? Do you give? Yes, I do. 
How do you give? I'm actually old school, so I get the envelope and then I actually write down the number for my debit card and that's how I give. It's that easy. It's simple, yeah. Give the old school way. It's possible. Hey, excuse me. Do you give? Absolutely. How do you give? Oh, I just do PayPal on payday in the morning. Very easy. Anybody can do it. Everybody should do it. There's three ways to give and you can do it too. You sit on the couch anyway. Do all things without murmurings and disputings that ye may be and the sons of God without where among whom ye you want to know why people have followed degradation down into the pits of hell <clears throat> it's because the lights that were in their life didn't shine In the absence of water, people will drink the sand. And even if it'll kill them, they don't care because they have no other alternatives. It's a massive failure of the church to allow prayer to be taken out of schools. You know, it's funny. I was, I was listening to a statistic and it said that um, I'm going to try to get it right. Uh, I'm going to get close. I might not be exactly on it, but it was something to the effect of 70 or 80 percent of Christians don't vote. It was a high, I mean, it wasn't like 50-50, wasn't it? It was like 70 or 80 percent of believers don't vote. Can you imagine what the world would look like if we took our responsibility to influence this world, Amen. to be light. Yes. But listen, on the other side of it, we sit back and we complain about, and we talk about what isn't, we talk about what is wrong, we talk about policies and things of that nature, and we say things about how we feel about what is being done, what quote-unquote politicians are doing, and yet 70% of those people don't even vote? How, how does that even make sense? How do we be light in a world that doesn't, is not framed by our choices? If you are Muslim, people have way more respect for you. If you say you're Christian, you, you need to shut up and go sit down somewhere. Your vote is not recognized. It's not valued because there isn't one. No one panders for your vote because you don't matter. And it's because we have not made a decision to be light in a perverse can we handle this? Oh, yes, sir. And a crooked nation. If you ever thought the government was supposed to be good, you are sadly mistaken because the government has never been good. Ever. It has never been the place of good. The church was supposed to be the place of good. Amen. And we have to be mindful that if we are lights in the world, then we have to let that light shine. Yes. I, I, I believe it was here where we talked about how uh, I was talking to um, mom and dad and uh, Dr. Ricky and Dr. Sally, and we were talking about kids, and we were talking about how sports have taken over to where people think sports are more important than church. Kids sports, you know, high school, stuff like that. And <clears throat> events now are moved to Sunday. Events are now on, you know, church nights and stuff. And, they, and I said, how did y'all deal with that? And they said, we didn't. We just didn't show up. And there were so many of us that when we pulled our kids out, they had to make an adjustment. <laughs> See, <laughs> but we as believers, we support that stuff. Oh, you know, it's just church. We'll miss it. 
And we have no idea that we're sending a signal, not only to our kids, but to the world, that church doesn't matter. Sports matter. Did you know that it was something, again, another statistic, it was something to the effect of 80 to 90% of young men in prison had aspirations and thoughts that they would be a professional musician, rapper, singer, athlete, and never made it. The somewhere along the line, someone instilled in them that that was the only answer. And when they didn't make it, they turned to other things because of the disappointment, the frustrations. And we run around trying to coax our kids into thinking they're the next. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, could they be the next? They might. It gets possible. It's not likely, though. It's not likely. And we don't teach them to aspire. Because it's funny, because when you look at Jewish children, they're talking to them about being doctors and lawyers. I don't, I don't like y'all response. <laughs> or the lack thereof. And we have to understand that just as the moon reflects the sun, S-U-N, we are to reflect the S-O-N. We are to do things that are different and be okay with being different. We, we, are, we are in a world that forces conformity. You either conform or you get ridiculed, you get attacked, you get ostracized. So get in where you... And I believe there's a season coming where people are being raised up to not conform to what the world is trying to do. And anyone with a reasonable intellect should be able to see where this is all going. Please explain to me how a seven-year-old or a five-year-old has any clear constructs of sexuality. But yet we endorse them changing, horrifically modifying their bodies, taking hormones. And we think it's... And you see celebrities doing it. And you're like, oh, it must be okay. In what world? My child is still putting together Legos. In what world would that be okay? The world is devoid of even common sense. And yet we are always clear about what the problem is. But I think as believers, we forgot what the answer is. Everybody say me. Look at Matthew 5.13. Matthew And he said, you are the salt of the earth, but the salt lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted, it is this thenceforth uh, good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Verse 14. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, put it on a candle, but put it on a candlestick, that it giveth life unto all 
that are in the house. Let your light shine before men so they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy. He said, but I came to fulfill. And when he said, I came to fulfill, this, this is an important understanding because people think or try to uh, teach, if you will, that he did not come to, or he came to eliminate all the rules. And notice what he said. I didn't come to destroy it. He said, I came as the answer to it. People think, oh, well, you know, the, the, the Ten Commandments don't apply to us today. The rules of the world don't apply to us today. Where do we get that from? Because he doesn't say that. And the important part, let me, let me show you real quick. Let's go to um, keep your finger and let's go to Matthew um, 13, 33. Another parable he spake unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto what? Which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. All these things Jesus spake unto the multitude in parables and without a parable spake he not unto them. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven put into meal that it didn't stop until the whole batch was leavened if you have ever used for baking purposes uh, baking soda or uh, yeast the whole point of it is that it begins to consume and it makes things puff it makes things aerate it brings once you have put yeast or you have put baking soda into something, you cannot take it out. And it permeates the entire batch that you put it in. Have you ever heard of uh, sourdough bread? Sourdough starts with a starter. Some starters are like 20, 30 years old. They're, they're, they're a literally living organism, so to speak, that is a batch of bread that they just take a piece of it They put it into the new, and it infiltrates and continues to ferment and to change. That's where you get sourdough bread from. It's bread that's been leavened. And he says, you have a purpose. Your job is to infect this world until this world looks like him. That's why he calls you leaven. He said, I didn't come to destroy the rules. He said, I came to fulfill the penalty associated with the rules so that you could begin to infect the world with who we are. To bring the world to the knowledge of God, to bring the world to the knowledge of Christ so that they are understanding who we are and what's afforded to us. So that's why he said it's like an unto a woman who puts a little bit of leaven and it leavens the whole lump. Eventually, that's why <clears throat> unleavened bread is flat bread. So when you, when you eat a um, communion wafer, you notice there's no puffiness to it. That's because there's no leaven in it. All flat breads are unleavened bread. Once you put any type of leavening in it, it changes the consistency in its entirety. And you are likened to an agent of change. That it is your job to bring the gospel to the people so they begin to know and eventually believe 
and come to the knowledge of him. And it's through your life. It's through your interaction. So let's look at um, Revelations 3.15. I've been attending Stone Point Community Church for 11 years now and I absolutely love it. It's my church home. I have a three-year-old daughter named Mayana and it's extremely important for me to set the right example for her when it comes to honoring God with my finances. God has been so good to me with my business that tithing has given me a steady flow of income. I'm a hairstylist and I'm fully convinced that because I've been faithful with my tithing that my clients book appointments and come in like clockwork. Before they weren't seeing me as often, now they see me on a consistent basis even after doubling my price for my haircuts. My name is Ator Benjamin and this is my tithing testimony. Revelations 3, 15 and 16, it says, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot or nor cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot so that because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. He talks to believers and he says that I would rather you be cold or hot. He said, but to be lukewarm in the middle, he said, I'll spew you out. Now, in those times, tepid water was used. Lukewarm water was used to induce vomiting. If you drink a lot of, of, of lukewarm water very, very quickly, it will typically induce some type of reaction. And he said, that's why I'll spew you out of my mouth because you're neither hot nor cold. Now, one of the popular misconceptions of this is the idea that he's saying if you're cold, meaning you're indifferent, but that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is if you're cold, meaning what is better than a cold glass of water on a very hot day? What is better than a hot bowl of soup on a very cold day? What he's saying is that you should be the answer to whatever the situation is and bring refreshing to the world, to bring healing to the world, to bring help to the world. Not just to be lukewarm, to sit back and sit in the chair and, and thank God at least I'm saved. I made it to church tonight. But what about? <laughs> and we are to always to seek people who are in trouble, who are in transition, and who are under tension. In trouble, transition, and under tension. If we would be honest with ourselves, every one of us sought God when we were in trouble, we were in transition, or we were in some level of tension. That's where he excels. See, it's like uh, my first, my first, no, my second job. My first job was a movie theater. My second job was at a company that was called Best. It was later called Service Merchandise. And it was a company or a retail establishment where it was a warehouse upstairs and a showroom floor downstairs. And so you would pick what you want. You would just grab these cards of everything you wanted. You would go to register and pay for it. And then the warehouse would package it up and ship it down through a conveyor belt. And then you would pick it up. And I ended up working returns, which I hated working returns. You want to know why I hate working returns? Because everybody in the return lane has a problem. People are always excited when they're buying stuff. But when they got to return it because something's wrong with it, it wasn't what they wanted, they received a gift from somebody they didn't like, it was just a constant negative experience. So we have learned to avoid problems because we understand their negative experiences. But how many of you know God was built for that? There is no problem that you could bring to God that he's like, oh, well, I don't have an answer for that. 
And we're wired to steer clear of messiness. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, people that are in messes are the ones who have the greatest message. We're okay. Amen, Pastor. I know. <laughs> and it's true that the messier the person is, <laughs> the messier the situation they're in, the messier, when they're in trouble, they're in transition, or they're under tension. And these are the people that unfortunately, like I said, we're kind of wired to steer clear of messy. Because we're of that mindset, if I break it, I got to fix it. When in reality, you didn't break it. The world broke it. But only God can put it back together. And when God puts it back together, which he can, will, and always has. He doesn't care how bad it is. He doesn't care how ugly it was. He doesn't care how difficult it seems. God is the God of miracles. God is the God of change. God is the God of answers. And how do we have the ability to know a God like that and never open our mouths about it? How do we live with answers? <laughs> and never say, even if they've told you you're crazy, even if they called you a Jesus freak. See, because some of you take that, that mindset that uh, Jonah took. Jonah said, the people are crazy, let them die. God said, no, I want you to go talk to them. He said, I'm not going to talk to them, they're crazy. They go on and die, let them die. Didn't work for Jonah. <laughs> and it ain't going to work for you. <laughs> You're the salt the light, and 11. How are you going to say, let them die? That's what you're here for. Amen. You don't know the story of Jonah. Let me tell you what happened. This is, this is for the people in the back because the people in the front already know. I'm, I'm teasing. People in the, some of the people in the front don't know either. But <clears throat> listen, Jonah decided he wasn't going to go tell the people. So Jonah went the opposite direction. Jonah ended up on a boat with a bunch of other people. And the boat came under tremendous attack. And they said, which one of you has done something wrong? Because somebody on this boat has obviously done something wrong. This level of attack doesn't come for no reason. It ended up, they figured out it was Jonah. They threw Jonah off the boat. Jonah ends up in the belly of the whale. And that's where he got his act right. <laughs> and I want you to understand something. Isn't it funny <clears throat> how the people are acting crazy and God said, I won't pour judgment out on them, but I'll send someone to help them. But the person who won't help them, he says, I'll pour my judgment out on you. Because you know better, they don't. <laughs> she said, I love it. <laughs> You're about the only one in here but me. <laughs> and it's because the responsibility is important. And we can get so caught up in day-to-day -day life. We can get so caught up in stuff. We can get so caught up in programs. We can get so caught up in day-to-day -day activities that we forget all about 
the responsibility to seek opportunities. To seek those opportunities with people, to invest and to invite. You may not know what to say. You don't have to. You may not know what scriptures to use. You don't have to. All you've got to do is get them into a place where the Holy Ghost is present. And answers will come. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I long to see your face that I may impart what is lacking in your faith. There are answers in the house. How many of you have gotten answers? Exactly. And it wasn't a a personal one-on-one conversation. A lot of times the Holy Ghost will begin to address things in the room to make sure you leave with an answer, with a solution. Anything that God will ever do will always come down to a divine strategy. Never forget that. Never forget that. Everything that God will do will always come down to a divine strategy. He will say, this is how it needs to be done. It will always work against what the world would say. It will always be somewhat outlandish from what the world will tell you. But it's because that when it works, there is no other definition or explanation as to why it worked. It had to be supernatural. This is why when you follow world plans, they tend to fail. Because they're not the divine strategy that God has given to you. And so he tells us that it's our responsibility. He says, I know your works. He said, not rather you have been hot or you have been cold, but to sit in the middle and do nothing? To sit in the middle and quote unquote mind your own business? <laughs> Look at Luke 9. <clears throat> Who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory. And the two men that stood with him, and it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make tabernacles for me, for one for thee, I'm sorry, one for Moses and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. He saw Moses and Elijah and Jesus all together and he got so caught up in the miracle of seeing that that he said let's make a tabernacle for you guys to hang out in his immediate response is let's find a place and rest let's find a place and sit and Jesus corrected him and said that's not what we're here for but it's the natural inclination of people to want to find a place to dwell in it. You're not to dwell in it. You're to take it with you. We have things that happen in our lives where we get delivered from, we get blessed through, and we just want to dwell in it. Isn't this wonderful? Let's tabernacle here for a while. Hmm. No. That's not what this is about. We're not supposed to just hang out in it. And they got caught up in the miracle and not the miraculous one. God told them, the most high doesn't dwell in houses made with human hands. Remember, he said, the heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What kind of house could you build for me? But yet, that's what we, come come on, somebody. Don't make this hard on me. But that's what we want to do. We want to sit back and kind of marinate in it. Isn't this great? Yeah, well, every miracle comes with an assignment.
this is why people can struggle with being awake. Do you remember when <clears throat> they were with Jesus and Jesus is like, I got to go pray with the Father. And he comes back and they were asleep. And he tells them to wake up. He leaves again. He comes back in their sleep. And then he says, go ahead, I want to sleep. Every major move of God, there will be a spiritual and a supernatural attack to want to get you disconnected and to stay asleep. God was moving in that moment. He was revealing things in that moment. And they were fighting to stay up. That spirit of slumber was coming upon them in such a way that they just were like, I can't even resist it. I just have to go to sleep. We've got to learn how to be woke and not the world's woke. Because this stuff the world calls woke is not woke. It's crazy. But to be recognizing and discerning the time and the seasons in which we're in. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 6. <coughs> when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father has put in his own power. They thought, when they saw Jesus again, they thought, this is going to be it. Right? This thing is wrapping up. He's like, no, we still got more work to do. Isn't it how we always are, though? We're always anticipating, when are we done? You, you ask a child to do something, all they want to know is, when is it done? You go driving somewhere, are we there yet? It's like, dear God, if we were there, you'd know we were there. So why ask us 500 times on the way? It's just like human nature to want to be there and not take the time to get there. And he said, we got to discern the seasons we're in. This is not over. I know we can get comfortable in the routines and the pomp and circumstance of church and activities and things like that. And we can get so caught up in that that we almost think it's over. Wow. It's not over. It hasn't even fully begun yet. There is so much that still needs to be accomplished. Look at Luke 19, verse 11. During this break, you can pull out your phone to leave a review on our Facebook page. Let us know about your experience here at Stone Point. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to leave one for us on Google as well. We're really looking forward to hear what you have to say about Stone Point. Luke 19, verse 11. As they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh unto Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God should immediately what? He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country and received for himself a kingdom and to return. He called his ten servants, delivered them ten pounds and said, Can you put that in the NIV? Keep going. Look what he says, verse 13. Put this money to work until I come back. Put in the NLT. Invest this for me while I'm gone. In other words, tell him to do business. He said, until I come back, do business. Who's telling the story? And Jesus is saying, I went on. You're not here just waiting for me to return. 
you're here to occupy until I come. Did we, we did uh, NIV, NLT, put it in the NASB. <clears throat> and he called ten of his slaves, gave them ten minas, and said to them, Everything God gave you, all of your talents and all of your abilities, you're supposed to be conducting business until he comes back. Not your business. Kingdom business. That's why I told him to occupy until I come. This is so important for us to recognize and to discern that it is our job to do business. We're to transact heavenly business. What's heavenly business? Snatching people from the grips of hell. What's heavenly business? Recovering the sheep that are lost. There are some that, that maybe they are saved, but they don't, they're not a part of the fellowship. Whatever it takes to bring people back into the plan and purpose of God we are to do business. He said, until, when do we stop? It's easy. When did, he st- when did we stop? Did he come back yet? Then you and I got a job to do, don't we? Look at Ephesians 5.14. Ephesians 5.14. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead. And Christ shall give thee light. See that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Doing what? Because? Look at uh, Colossians 4, 5. (coughs) Colossians 4, 5. Put in the Amplified, please. Classic. Behave yourselves wisely, living prudently <clears throat> and with in your relations to those of the outside world, the non-Christians. Making the most of the time, seizing and doing what? The opportunity to do what? To influence. The opportunity to do what? To invest. The opportunity to do what? To invite The opportunity to do what? To represent the kingdom. To do what salt does. To do what light does. This is our job. He said, why? Because the days are evil. So it's it's our responsibility to find opportunities to do business. To look for people that are in trouble. To look for people that are in tension, to look to people that are in transition. We want to look the other way. But he tells you to go find those people and make use of those opportunities. It's funny how when people think they got their life together, and I don't want to dismiss those people because those people need Jesus too. But have you ever noticed that when people's lives go south, and God steps in, they become pretty well assured that God is real. And he said, we're to look for those opportunities. We're to look for those people that are in the struggle. We are to look for those people that are misinformed. We are to look for those people that are broken and redeem the time to buy back what God is trying to do. To be the salt, to be the light, to be the leaven, so that we can affect this world for the kingdom. Because how many of you know that's what this is all about? At the end of the day, when the music stops, when when the programs are over, when the announcements are done, when the sermons are over, at the end of the day, the end result is to snatch people from the grips of hell. <clears throat> and that means the unsaved people 
And it also means some of the saved people who are, who are literally at some point on their way back into a hell. And we are the ones who are tasked with that responsibility to snatch people out of it. Amen? So all stand up. Be up to date with the latest sermons and listen to Stonepoint Community's podcast. It's also a quick and easy way to share these messages with your friends and family. Stay inspired throughout your week and listen. I'm a person who believes that prayer has power and that prayer works. And so I'm going to tell you what I'm going to pray for. And you can go ahead and opt out if you wish. <clears throat> but those of you who are opting in, um, you just come into agreement. But Father God, I thank you that in our future, in the days to come, that you would illuminate those who are in trouble, who are in transition, who are under tension. Give us the courage. Give us the courage to be salt and to be light. Give us the courage to make an investment into someone other than ourselves. Give us the courage. Once you illuminate it to us, I know you will. In the next coming days, I know you will. Help us to discern what to do and how to do it. So your word tells us that if we open our mouth, you'll fill it. You'll be right there in the moment that we need you. <clears throat> Help us to see those that need you. That by the direction of the Holy Spirit that you would illuminate in us who, when, where, and how, and to what extent. And we know, we decree and declare, you'll do it. And we'll be an obedient vessel when you do. We thank you for the privilege and the pleasure that it is to be of service to you to be used by you. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. We give you all glory and all honor. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Sure, I love you guys. And we will see you on Sunday, the big day, Money Matters. Bring somebody with you. It's going to be good. Thank you for listening to today's message. I hope you'll subscribe so you can receive the latest podcast to keep encouraged and inspired all through the week. Help us to continue to share the message of hope with those all around the world. Visit scc.church or click the link in the description to partner with us today. We hope you share this message with a friend and be sure to follow us on social media. We're praying for you. I know God's best is still ahead. We will see you next time.